Yes, sir. G'day, how are you? Um, Helen, first question for you. You mentioned about the um, uh, flood, the floor level viewer. Large areas of that have been greyed out and we can't access those. We used to be able to access them and then it was stopped about a year ago. Are those available yet? That's in the Flockton area. Uh, thanks, your Andy. Uh, your question, Andy. I'll take the uh, minute to respond to that, if that's all right. Um, uh, so there's grey areas. There's different levels of certainty across the flood modelling within the city, and there's some areas where we, in setting floor levels for residents that council uses a range of information, and so those greyed out areas are areas where council uses um, a range of different different data sources in order to provide floor levels to people and it's best done um, on an individual property basis considering those different ranges of information. So that's one of the reasons why we don't um, publish uh, uh, floor level information in those areas. I can uh, let you know though that inside the Land Range Recovery Program we're just undertaking a, a significant modelling exercise, that project's just kicked off, that will um, give us even greater certainty about the hydraulic models that we're we're using, and provide us more detail and better resolution throughout much parts, many parts of the city, in terms of um, hydraulic modelling. And I hope that information um, will better inform council and, and floor level setting, and enable greater areas of the city to be displayed in the floor level viewer. So you're saying that the previous information there may not be correct now? I'm just uh, council. Uh, we like to, in, in those areas where we've got more information now available, we like to, to use that, and so that that conversation is best had in person with individual okay. residents. Yep. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Hi. Um, if, if you've got a property that isn't going to be rebuilt like the neighbours are, and their land is being raised, your land is left at the same level, um, you receive a, a diminution of, value, of um, value payment from AQC for a settlement, and even though the declaratory judgment says that shouldn't be a default position, their attitude is that your, your land can't be remediated. How, who can you go to, what, what can you do to um, try and mitigate the flood water on your property in that situation? Given, presumably, if the neighbours have got a new house which requires a building platform that's 300 millimetres higher than it was, then, then the flood water that was there is now going to be on your section? Or is, is that not the case? I mean, I know from the building consent point of view, they're supposed to illustrate that they've mitigated against adverse effects to prop, um, neighbouring property owners, but I don't believe this is happening. <laughs> it's too hard. <laughs> Yes, before a, um, before a building consent is issued, one of the things that they check is that the risk is not being transferred to a neighbouring property. How, how do they do that? They'll come, out, they'll come out and do an assessment on the site. So um, if, you, if you're concerned about a particular site, if you come and talk to us afterwards, then we can get the details about that particular site. But it, is, it does depend on each site and what the, um, what the layout of it is, whether or not it's going to deflect to the neighbours, and that will be checked out. Does anybody else want to? John? The purpose of the Resource Management Act 2 is to prevent adverse effects to land um, being inflicted on neighbours, and so there may be some relief or remedy under that Act and there is also a legal cause of action called private nuisance, which basically means that neighbours cannot allow negative impacts to happen to their neighbours because of things that are on their property as well. 
So that could be worth exploring too. Thank you. Uh, Helen, you were talking about the high hazards. I see ECAN notified that on the 25th of July and said it took a legal effect. Uh, when are they going to be notified to the owners of those properties? That they're high hazard. I'm in one of the high hazard parent, according to that, but I've not been notified. Yes, so the high hazard provisions for the district plan will be notified on the 25th of July and letters will go out to all affected property owners at that time. What constitutes a high hazard? The high hazard? Okay, so the high hazard is defined, you're absolutely correct, by Environment Canterbury in their regional policy statement. And what we do is they we... passed it to you on the 25th of July, didn't they? Oh, that's the coastal provisions. Yeah. But, um, the, yes, yeah, so there's... Yeah. The high hazard mapping is we, um, we map the one in 500 year event where the floodwaters are either more than a metre deep or they're swift, and it's where the product of the depth and the velocity is more than one. So that defines the high hazard areas, and they're a, um, a small subset of the broader uh, flood management areas. So those provisions, those, those have all been mapped and will be notified 25th of July, and if you've got a property within one of those areas, then, then you'll receive a letter then. What's the outcome for high hazard areas? In terms, if you have you already got a house on that property? We do. Yeah, so you've got existing use rights in terms of that property, and it doesn't affect that house in that terms, but if you wanted to extend that house, uh, then you'd be required to get resource consent, and the, the risk would be assessed at that time. Existing use rights, uh, according to, for us, of course, we have to deal with earthquake damage within this context as well, when you're changing, when the rules are changing and, and getting new areas. So existing use rights is only for our purpose, isn't it? Existing use rights apply to, um, to anybody who's, for, for the activity that's already taking place on the property. So if the, if the floor level is below the inundation... I'll, yep, come, so I'll come talk to you afterwards about your particular it's situation. It's pretty important for even not high hazards. Uh, yes. Floor levels at inundation level outside of the uh, Building Act yep. and existing use rights. I think that needs to be addressed. Okay, so um, the position in terms Sorry, of right. so in terms of the Building Act, if you're a rebuild, there's no existing use rights under the Building Act. So if you're a rebuild, your floor level has to be above the level of the one in fifty flood. Um, if if you're a rebuild within a flood management area, if you were a new build within a flood management area, you'd be required to comply with the one in 200 floor level. New but build. if you're a rebuild, so you previously had a house and what you're doing is rebuilding that house, then you can have existing use rights and your floor level only needs to be at the one in 50. You can, but it's not mandatory. That's for you to choose. Council, council um, only gets involved if a consent is applied for. Mm -hmm. So if a building consent is applied for, then that is, those are the rules that are followed. If a resource consent is applied for, then those are the rules that are followed. So it's, um, council doesn't have a choice as such, but it, it, has, to, uh, it has to apply the law. The homeowner's choice. Yes, it's a homeowner's choice. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah. And the answer is yes. <laughs> All right, so thank you for that. I do think those are some important questions that you've raised, and certainly if you want to discuss that further, you can afterwards. But do you have a question? Um, hello. Uh, talking about the uh, mitigation things being put in place at the moment and the consultation through Dudley, and not going in that in depth, but um, the, the mapping of the 50-year floodplain as it is now um, compared to what it was pre-earthquake, which has changed significantly, um, and Dudley's uh, remediation is for uh, putting it back to pre-earthquake flood risk. Um, uh, I live quite a bit closer to the Avon, um, at just opposite the red zone, and so... Uh, flood banks, temporary or permanent, uh, when is some um, uh, information going to be about where they are and what sort of inundation level they're going to 
uh, protect against because as Dudley has been uh, proposed to put back to pre-earthquake flood risk, why are other parts of the city not being afforded the same courtesy? I wasn't in the 50-year floodplain, now I am in the 50-year floodplain, and the Dudley Creek in um, remediation in some ways is going to exasperate that. So I guess the question is, what's the long-term, or what's the short-term and long-term planning about the, um, the flood blank banks around the Avon, and what's going to happen about those low-lying properties that are on the, um, by the river, are those areas going to be pumped into the Avon because otherwise they're just going to fill up. Even if the banks don't burst, the water's not going to get out. Thank you for your question. There's uh, probably many facets in the response to that. So I'll deal with a couple, then I'll let Helen deal with a couple. Um, you mentioned uh, Dudley Creek being afforded um, uh, a level of protection or restoration to pre-quake flood risk. Yes, uh, that is the objective of the Dudley Creek proposal inside the Land Range Recovery Program. Now that Land Range Recovery Program uh, is considering uh, engineering intervention across many parts of the city and looking at changes in flood risk associated with the earthquake across many parts of the city. And it happens that we have to prioritise that, that programme um, in order to uh, yeah, respond to the needs of the community. And Dudley Creek was identified as a very high need and the, program, the Land Range Recovery Programme has focused some effort on that area in particular. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, the Recovery Programme is not going to consider works in other parts of the city. It very much will. Um, and it's just a, a timing thing. So we'll be looking at um, potential for uh, engineering works going in in other, in other areas. It's just going to take a little bit more time. And considering flood risk on the Avon is um, part of the program, and it's a very complex question, um, but it's not something that's being ignored at all. I think, Helen, you might have some additional points. So flood protection along the Avon is, is further complicated by the future use of the red zone. So the largest area of red zone is along the Avon River, and until decisions are made on future use of the red zone, then there won't be final designs of the stop bank system. So what Council has been working on at the moment is a number of scenarios for possible stop bank locations, depending on what those future use uh, consultation and then decisions being made by central government, how those come out. So yes, there are plans for stop banks and for protection uh, of the, the green zone properties in particular and any development that may come following the future use, but we don't have you know, firm plans that we can show you today. So I guess the things being done for putting extra volume quicker into the Avon it's a bathtub effect. You have a full bathtub and then you um, put water in faster and in this case uh, option B and C of the Dudley uh, Creek uh, bypass you put six, uh, between five and six cubic metres of water a second pretty much right in front of my property where it's flooding already and with that flood risk now with the properties all dropping half a metre and not being in the 50 year floodplain, and now being in the 50 year floodplain, see that as actions that are um, detrimental to those residents without mitigation for putting that, those large amounts of water in. Yeah, okay, so that, that comes back to Tom's point about it being complicated, and you're right, it is complicated. So the, um, in terms of the scenarios for the stop banks, one of the things that we're looking at is uh, more detention ponds. Um, behind the stop banks so that the water doesn't race into the, into the river quite so quickly and also to treat the stormwater that's coming in and then release it into the river and also ponds and treatment facilities within the stop banks if you like so along the sides of the Avon River so that we address both those quantity and quality issues but the final design of those um, isn't, isn't yet able to be... And the 
large put in place. The puzzle would be the not being allowed to use any of the red zone land for the access or being allowed to even consider it at this Well, the, the red zone along the Avon River is essentially the floodplain of the river. So um, the river will use it for that purpose, you can be sure. And it's managing that in the, over the longer term and managing other uses of that land. Great, thank you for that. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my question is mainly, and it's three questions in one, if you'll bear with me, because they're all interrelated. Now, uh, I live in the Flockton area, and it's all regarding around all the waterways. It's mainly aimed at Raymond, but other people may be able to actually come in and um, uh, resolve or answer some of my questions. And uh, you mentioned about all the changes that's occurred, the many complexities that are involved with the waterways. And what I've noticed is one fluvial change within a lot of the waterways because of land drop or land rising. And with that, you get your silt. Also, because of the variations in your flows, you're getting erosions because of the way the streams have always existed and we haven't altered them. Also, some of the maintenance, which I'm sure you're all aware of because I've made council aware of it, is that uh, the maintenance need to be brought up to keep these waterways clear. What I'm asking is what is the long-term strategies to, for dealing with these problems and the short-term ones? I, I realise it's quite complex, but um, I think it's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah. I'll do my best to answer that. As you say, it is quite complex and it certainly varies from waterway to waterway. Um, can I just explain? Yeah. Uh, if I can explain to you, uh, 14 months ago, hmm. I knew nothing about waterways. Uh, <laughs> I've learned because I, I'm, I'm looking at all the waterways in the Flockton. Mm. So I've researched it, I've looked in France, Germany, mm. and also in the UK. Mm. So I've looked at all the yep. dredging, all the other options, mm. and I'm fully aware of the complexities, mm. and each one's an individual case. We cannot compare what's happened in the UK because they're all different scenarios. I guess that the, and at the moment we have um, a package of works that's underway. Um, I think it's about two million dollars in value, which involves removing silt from about eight different sections of the waterway uh, land drainage network around Christchurch. So uh, there's, there's certainly a commitment to that. Um, that's being funded jointly by council and central government um, and we've got another substantial provision for that work again in the next financial year and in fact reduces slightly in value but um, there's quite a continuation I think from memory for the next five to ten years um, to address those types of issues, those types of earthquake effects. The thing I would encourage you to think about and, and it's an issue that we had a, a community meeting to talk about Heathcote flood hazard a few months ago um, and there's certainly a number of people who live alongside the Heathcote River who advocate that the Heathcote needs to be dredged, excavated to restore its capacity um, aka what the, uh, the past drainage board practices. Um, if you look at that type of exercise uh, it's very expensive, it's quite environmentally damaging and it doesn't actually realise as much benefit as people think. The reason that silt accumulates in a waterway is because the water is moving very slowly. If it was moving faster, that would actually be mobilising sediment away. And the reason that sediment's accumulating in the Heathcote, it's, it's, admittedly, it's got quite an inflow from all of the tributary systems into the main river channel. Um, but that river has a very flat grade, and it runs into the Heathcote estuary there, and there's a lot of backwater effect that causes that silt to accumulate. So. It's, I guess, for Council, um, and Tom talked about land drainage recovery program, Heathcote River is one of those land drainage recovery program projects, and the intent of those projects is to look at all of those changes, those earthquake effects, and work out what, what mix of strategies, and there are a range of strategies, including planning strategies, what 
combination is going to best address their issues in that particular catchment. I've already sent um, correspondence to the miti mitigation group and I'm going to be sending another one yeah. after I've been here yeah. because it's important that we all work together because yeah. we're all concerned about the same thing. Yeah, we, we see. Yeah. Just picking up your point that you've raised before about the Avon and, and might not have been covered off by Tom and that is that with the permanent stop bank structures that are proposed for the Avon, as, as Helen says, there's certainly residential red zone considerations in that but most of the design standard for the permanent structure has a, a level crest, a flat crest, and that is because most of the flood hazard along the lower reach of the Avon is dictated by sea level and storm surge rise, not necessarily the flow on the river channel. There's certainly quite a bit of capacity in the Avon where the Dudley meets the Avon, so it's important to... Certainly the, the upper parts of the Avon where the river flows more freely has a surface slope on it, but the lower part of the Avon, the surface slope, the design surface slope, which is fairly high, is dictated by the level of the estuary, the level of the tide, the storm surge event that Helen referred to in her presentation. And that comes out from the 6th of July, is that when that was made up The natural hazards? 25th of July. 25th of July. Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm, I live in Sumner, so we don't have a lot of the flooding issues going in the city, but because we live in a catchment and there's not a lot of houses, are not flat, it's hilly, we catch all that rainfall coming down through the middle of the village. Um, one of the issues we face is if the storm outlets are not in working order, we have a real issue. When they are working, it works and we don't get flooded. How can we be sure that the contractors and the actual um, upkeep or the maintenance of those storm drains are constantly monitored. So rather than having to get a crane in to lift up a lid, that that's re replaced or repaired rather than residents or stressing out, oh my gosh, when's this going to get fixed? You know, Marnie at the hub, I don't have the answers. That's council's job. But how, what can I go back and tell the residents what the council has planned to deal with that issue? You're talking about the Cave Rock outfall, aren't you? Is it? There's one down Scarborough End. Yes. And the other one that's one down Scarborough End, one that's a bit further up that requires yeah. the crane. And yeah. the one at the last, the, the, the Cave Rock End worked perfectly, apparently. Yep. No one got flooded. Yep. So you got high praise for that with emails. I saw yep. those, which is yep. great. Yep. But sometimes they don't work, and sometimes the contractors, because they don't live there, they don't live and breathe the area. So, you know, like, what can we do to have a. a, a um, a collaborative approach where the community works with the contractors and the council to what, make it happen. <laughs> what, I, what I can tell you is that the contractor, particularly in that case, does live there and drives past it on his way to work and, and has a vested interest. He lives locally in that Sumner area. City Care, the maintenance contractor for land drainage operations, and they are acutely aware of that issue and they need to keep those outfalls um, working in a, in, a, in a free condition. I think, as you're probably aware, um, we have tried with the uh, jet operation units to um, delegate some of that operation in the past, um, and that led to a horrendous water bill for council, and also, as I understand it, some health and safety issues for people on the beach. So we're certainly aware of that issue. Um, it's on City Care's super critical list of um, parts of the network to check with he when heavy rainfall is forecast. So they, they are acutely aware of it, um, and I guess the, the best I can do is give you my assurance that they are aware of it and that we will continue to make sure that they uh, do those the necessary inspection and maintenance activity. Are you aware that the Sumner Fire Brigade put their hand up to offer to work with Council? I am aware of that. Cool. Um, again, given that it's a council asset uh, and that it requires an element of judgment and decision making um, and there's also elements of liability associated with that, that um, council's preference in those instances is to have our contractor actually um, take care of those maintenance responsibilities so there's no ambiguity about where the buck stops and city care are pretty clear about that. Yeah. 
possibly. Yeah, yeah it's a different yeah. way to. Uh, but it's, it is. Want to, you know, yeah. Well, it's yeah. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, it's it's an aware it's an issue that City Care are aware of, and and it's certainly something that's checked on a regular basis. Regarding what's just sure. yeah, we've got time it, for it, one it'll only more. take me a moment, but it's just regarding I made a deputation to the local community board and the maintenance programme has gone forward as a recommendation, so it's going to council. Okay? Yeah, I just thought it should be made clear that that's, that, that is occurring. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for that. So we're going to uh, wrap up the Q&A session.